Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the October meetup of uh, EFKL. Uh, today, we'll be hosting Fred from Arbitrum, um, who will be discussing more about uh, layer two optimistic rollup and what Arbitrum does. As usual, our sponsor is Etherscan. And we'll start off our meetup with a monthly roundup. And uh, for that, before that, uh, just a couple announcements quick. Uh, so we're doing a bunch of polling and it's very like unofficial polling. Uh, you can answer in the chat here or maybe in the EFKL Telegram group. Uh, if there is interest in an unofficial EFKL in-person hangout, so we can just go lepa at a mama and there is no liability to the EFKL meetup group if anyone gets infected by COVID. But because we're not on lockdown anymore, if people are interested, uh, we can have a, a hangout session in person. So please uh, let us know. And uh, secondly, there were a couple people who uh, indicated interest in our Telegram group about a code together or office hour session. Uh, we can do that probably in Gather Town. Um, we can arrange one like uh, over, uh, let's say one hour over a weekend. So if there's enough interest for that, we can do that as well. Uh, so again, uh, let us know here or in Telegram. And lastly, there was quite a lot of interest in one of the tweets I think from Suraya from Ringgit or Ringgit, where I think we quote tweeted from EFKL to say that we can do like a basic uh, hands-on workshop on how to set up a wallet and some super basic uh, DeFi stuff. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, again, let us know. And I think for sure we'll do that because there was, I think at least like 30 people that, um, that said they wanted uh, for us to do it. So we'll find time over one of the next uh, upcoming weekends. All right, then for the monthly uh, roundup, um, let's uh, let Aswa take it away. Yep, um, thank you, Harif. Um, so yeah, so for our monthly roundup, so if you guys are on TikTok, and if you guys are not, welcome to the club. Um, so actually, uh, this is the first TikTok moment uh, at the auction, and it is live at the moment, and it is powered by Immutable X, which is on layer two. And if you are into, um, TikTok NFTs, then maybe this is something of your interest. I think the current bid, when I took the screenshot, it was around six, uh, six E. So yeah. Um, uh, next, sorry. Right, and and um, recently, um, China had tightened its crackdown on cryptocurrencies and had declared all cryptocurrency activities illegal. And one of the consequences of that is uh, Spark Pool, which is one of the biggest Ethereum mining pool, had had uh, closed its operation. Initially, they intended to just stop um, serving um, clients in China, but now they have decided to stop the entire operations. Um, next, sorry. And I actually just found out about this. So, um, France's third largest bank proposing to borrow $20 million die on Maker. And I think the bank is called Society General. And it is the third, uh, third largest bank, and they are proposing to uh, to use the bond that they are issuing on Ethereum as collateral. And this is actually, and this was actually posted on uh, Maker's forum, so it is not has so it, it has not been passed uh, in in the proposals yet. So it'd be interesting if to see whether the community actually takes up on this um, proposal. Um, I'll send the link to the forum post that was sent by um, uh, by the bank uh, if anyone is interested. And, and and in the forum that they mentioned that they want this to be a pilot to see if they can fit DeFi with uh, France legal banking system. So it's taking the term the future of France quite literally. Uh, yeah, next. Right. And uh, recently, uh, Rune Christensen uh, wrote an article um, uh, saying that uh, MakerDAO and the market community should lead DeFi and into um, investing into uh, solving climate change and some terms such as climate alpha where investing in businesses that have affected climate change into the business space come in and 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 he also argues that maker down governance should lead the way in, in DeFi in paving the way for a better um, uh, solution towards this uh, climate crisis that we are currently having uh, next and also uh, Polygon uh, recently launched, uh, uh, sorry, uh, so EY uh, has announced that it is integrating uh, Polygon into its existing blockchain services and it will be focusing on um, enterprise client and, and, and to further expedite the roadmap to integration with Ethereum mainnet. 
So I thought that that statement is quite interesting and I, and it is called EY Polygon Nightfall and we will be looking to uh, offer both um, private, uh, both uh, permission and public blockchains into uh, to its enterprise clients. Um, yeah. Next, uh, some local news. Um, so, um, Hetherland Inc's deal to operate a 1,000 cryptocurrency mining rigs in Malaysia. So it's a deal between a Singapore exchange uh, uh, company with uh, an asset management company, and it, and it's and it's going to start around um, the fourth quarter of this year. And it was, and it actually announced that it will repurpose its retail mall in Malacca for digital activities, including cryptocurrency. So if anytime when you're in Malacca, you can maybe take a look which mall are making the most noises. And uh, last but not least, um, so my EG, if you guys remember, recently my EG has uh, has uh, a quite a uh, good DeFi license, and and today they have announced a partnership with Chinese Ruby to set up a blockchain platform infrastructure, and it is a partnership to build quote unquote super nodes around the world based on the blockchain system that will be developed by China Ruby, and it will offer both private and public blockchain and which also will cover countries outside of Malaysia as well. Um, and I think that's what we have for the roundup. Um, I can give it back to you, Ari. Right. Uh, thanks, Aspa. I just want to make a quick mention to uh, uh, Sparkpool, uh, which is, uh, I think, right now, well, before the announcement, the second largest mining pool in Ethereum. And uh, just a quick mention, because uh, I think the story, if people who are not familiar uh, about them, is actually really cool. Like, it got started by a bunch of uh, community supporters of Ethereum. Uh, I think there was a platform called ETH Fans, and it was just a bunch of normal people in China. But because there was, there's just so many people in China that uh, when they, they just decided that if they could do something, um, and they thought they, what they would do would be a mining pool because there, there were so many of them. Um, and they started from essentially just a, a, a supporter community project into the uh, at times largest mining pool uh, in the world. And um, some of the stories I heard, I, 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 I hope other people can vouch whether it's true that um, they even had cases where like uh, there would be a small village, like imagine a small kampung somewhere in the middle of China um, in the rural areas where they have like maybe a windmill and that be electricity that gets generated by the windmill and no one actually uses it. And they, got, they just got like young people to set it up to a mining rig and whenever it's like the windy season, they would just like use it to mine some ether and use that to essentially fund their village. Uh, and when it's not windy, they'll just shut it down. So there are a lot of very cool stories like that. And uh, it's kind of a, a, a sad thing that they're leaving the, uh, the, entire, the entire Ethereum space. Um, yeah, so just, I just thought I'd mention that. A pretty cool story. Uh, all right, so uh, next on the agenda, I'll just stop my share. Um, can we get uh, Rafik from kitajaga.co to share uh, what you guys are doing with uh, NFTs uh, to incentivize uh, charity? Uh, hello, guys. So my name is Rafik. So I'm actually part of the team that's uh, been developing. We already, we already developed a P2P charity platform. And I'm going to share to you guys about our little project here. Uh, can you guys see my screen right now? But yeah, so Kito Jaga NFT campaign is actually just an extension of our own platform. So Kito Jaga for international people here, it's just a short, it's actually it's a Malay word called we, we, we take care because it's just a half of the saying that we saying kita jaga kita, meaning we take care of each other. Because during like, during the COVID lockdown, a few months ago, they, we were having a really worse time during our economic crisis, something like that. So we have a really good sentiment in social media that people are, you know, sharing about, okay, only us, only we can take care of each other right now. So in coming from that sentiment, our team kind of like, try to develop a really scrappy website, trying to help people to see who they can help during this time. So because of that, during, I think it's July or June. Okay, during July, we launched our platform and allows people to geotag themselves and what kind of help that they needed. And also people who can provide help, they can geotag themselves as well. And those who can provide help, they can just personally click 
the white flags and then see what kind of help that the person needed. And from there, you can actually interact with that person directly and ask them, uh, okay, what kind of help do you need? Do you need some sort of money or do you need some sort of, uh, uh, you know, stuff to eat? And because of that, uh, we developed this platform and it received a widely, it went viral and people adopt this platform for, for some time right now. So that's why we call ourselves as a P2P charity platform that allows both helpers and helpers to help their communities. So right now we are working a lot with the NGOs. So it's been a really good tool for NGOs as well to help the homeless, to help also the people who are really needed the help. So it became, um, it extends itself further than just for people to help with each other. Now, uh, even NGOs coming in and also corporate also share their services within our platform. So the reason right now, the team is actually trying to explore how to create like an incentive layer to P2P charity uh, ecosystem. So we are exploring the idea of utilizing NFTs. And that's why, because we, we are actually a software team that is, that's not really involved in blockchain application. That's not really involved in decentralized apps. And we think that this is actually a really good, for, a good way for team to understand how to utilize uh, blockchain app and also try to create an incentive layer for our ecosystem that we've created already. So is this NFTs that we created uh, is just a, a four week campaign where we reward users uh, in, in a form of NFTs and these NFTs are celebrating or in honor to frontliners that have helped curb the COVID-19 pandemic uh, a month ago. So these are pretty much a limited edition. I would say we only we, I think we're going to just produce 20, 20 of these things. So we're not going to produce any more of this. So the way we do this is that uh, people, they, they need to have a requirement, certain requirement to get these NFTs, meaning that for, for the first week, they only need to help two white flags. Then they are eligible to get these NFTs and they can claim these NFTs um, on Saturday. And there'll be only five each week. And I guess the people will need to like, uh, be the first five people to receive uh, to click on that button. Otherwise, they need to wait for the next week, and it will be a different requirement. And I realized that this this idea also came during like ETL meetup. I remember this, it was like a physical meetup where people were saying that we need to have like an NFTs to, to show like social proof of like social contributions to communities. So I. Because of that discussion, kind of stuck in my mind. So I was like, oh, PT Jaggi is actually a really good platform to try to test that. So this is actually the pretty much the UI that we created within our platform. If you see the first one, it's going to be like this one. These are the core features of the platform. But if you connect your wallet, you can see we have two pages, my NFT and also the redeem page. And you can also see uh, how many people that you have helped and also the countdown for you to redeem. So the moment that countdown goes to zero, the redeem button will, go, will turn on and you, and you can collect these NFTs. And also, uh, what, can, what can user do with these NFTs? So we, we try to figure out what kind of benefits that NFTs, uh, these NFTs holder can get. So our initial plan was to make sure it has like a social signaling as a badge for doing good. But I guess one of the reasons is that people don't really uh, our users are mainly not people that understand NFTs, but there's a lot of education that we put that as well in within our platform and also within our marketing material. And we also give them some sort of benefits of holding our uh, NFTs, meaning that Peter Jagger platform actually partner with a lot of corporates and they also give some sort of merchandises. And we, we try to make sure that whenever we have new partners, we can have these kind of benefits to distribute to the token, the NFT holders as well. Or if they want to sell it back, because these NFTs are actually uh, can be sell in NFT marketplace, the 40% of the royalty will go back to, will go to the Kita Jaga Operation uh, Fund. So it, it will be as a form of donation to maintain the platform activity. So the timeline is pretty much the same because it's quite experimental for us as well. So the first week will be helping two white flags. The second week will be um, helping five white flags. The third and fourth week is to be announced. We're not sure yet how we're going to create a requirement or give some sort of incentives that we can put into NFTs, but yeah. 
So for the future plans, as I said, it's just an introductory features for, for the team to explore the incentive career for P2P charity platform. And we actually have discussed a lot about how we can uh, use, utilize uh, NFTs into our platform. That means that we are thinking about creating some sort of smart contract protocol as well to, to distribute this kind of NFTs. And also we are thinking about open sourcing the, this platform as well, letting people, other countries or any other developers out there to try to you know, create this platform to help their communities as well. And after the campaign, we will try to gather again and try to tune the right incentive layer for our P2P ecosystem, utilizing NFTs. But yeah, so far that's it. Right, uh, thanks. thanks a lot, Rafiq. And uh, yeah, please feel free to share any related links uh, in the chat so people can find out. And if okay. I'm not, and if I'm not mistaken, the artist for those NFTs are uh, is Gio from the NFXT local community. Ah uh, uh, yes, yes. Do you mind sharing a little bit on that? Like, short so uh, we working, we are working with uh, one of the local artists, NFT artists as well in Malaysia. So his name is Gio. Uh, he has been doing a lot of pixel art as well. Uh, since the NFT boom, and he also does other art, uh, art, style, art style as well. And we are in the future, if this kind of thing has really big response, we are thinking about working with big artists as well, where they can uh, put their NFTs in our platform and create like a really good incentive for, you for people to help to you know uh, drop those in it in our platform. But those are in plan and, and we will need to revisit all of those plans, you know, after the fourth week in some sort. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Rafiq. Um, yeah, so uh, everyone, uh, check out Kika Jagger if you haven't uh, yet already. Um, and, you know, donate to someone in need who is uh, nearby. And without further ado, I'm going to get uh, Fred uh, from Arbitrum to uh, share your um, talk with everyone. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. So yeah, hey, I'm Fred. I'm a software engineer at Off King Labs and we're building out Arbitrum. It's a pleasure to be here at ETH Malaysia and talk to you all a bit about layer two scaling with Arbitrum. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat as I go along. I'll try to answer most of them. And I've been told that probably the first question I'll get is when token. So let me answer that already at the start so we can get that out of the way. And the token for Arbitrum right now is ETH. If you want to buy ETH, you can pay for gas in ETH in Arbitrum and use it. And I guess that's a great segue for my next slide, which is Arbitrum 1. And that's our flagship chain. We're live on mainnet right now as we speak. We've been live for developers since late May, I believe. So that's a couple of months. And we've been live for all end users for 43 days and counting. And yeah, so what is this that we have live, right? It's an optimistic rollup. And our goal here is to scale Ethereum, right? We want to make Ethereum cheaper and more usable. So many cool use cases, for example, so many NFTs just are so expensive and just so many get priced out. You need to like, the ones that are like, for example, so many use cases for, for different dApps are just too expensive to do on mainnet. And that's where Arbitrum comes in. We're trying to like increase the throughput and make it cheaper to interact with the blockchain. But yeah, as I said before, uh, we're trying to scale Ethereum. So let's take a back a bit and talk a bit about Ethereum, right? What's cool about Ethereum? One of the very cool things, at least in my opinion, I guess I don't need to chill it too hard here since we're in an Ethereum meetup as well, is <laughs> its security. Uh, it's about securing user funds, right? Uh, you have your tokens, you have your ETH balance, and we trust the network and the protocol to actually uphold that for, for us. Another really cool thing about Ethereum is that it gave us this sense of general computation, right? You can express code in solidity that you previously couldn't like using Bitcoin scripts and stuff like that. And just as a quick spoiler, what that allows us to do is to, to build fancier protocols on top of Ethereum, right? So for example, when you're talking about an optimistic rollup, the expressiveness you get out of like solidity is very useful. It's something that you, it wouldn't be as easy to pull off in Bitcoin. Uh, 
Yeah, and the last point I'd say is adoption, right? It's about, we have a lot of end users, we have a lot of developers, it's, we have a great community. Uh, the Ethereum community is one of the coolest things about it. Uh, but you can't talk about Ethereum if you're not talking about congestions as well, right? We've all seen NFT drops where like the gas prices go through the roof and you're just trying to find some block space, you're trying to include your transaction, but it's too expensive. And that's what we're here to address, like Arbitrum, we're trying to like keep the security, keep the generalized computation and reduce the congestion on chain. That means we can handle more people doing more things on the chain for a lower cost. So yeah, that brings us to Arbitrum, right? We're trying to inherit the security from Ethereum. So that means if a user's fund uh, is secure in Ethereum, it, if Arbitrum's protocol is implemented correctly and working, the same will hold. You still allow like programmers to have this generalized computation. So you can still use Solidity and express your smart contracts, your dApps and all that. And we're fully compatible with Ethereum. What that means is, for example, if you have a dApp, a smart contract running on regular Ethereum, we try to make it as easy as possible for you to also like have the benefits of cheaper computation using Arbitrum. And the way we pulled that off, that's the secret sauce and what, what puts us apart from the other people. So yeah, uh, we're talking about Arbitrum running on top of Ethereum and inheriting its security. But what does that mean, right? It means like you want the protocol to be just as secure, but you can't really be just as secure. You want to be as close as possible and make clear assumptions that will give you those properties, right? And the way at least I see it uh, from, let's say, a less technical perspective is you kind of branch off from mainnet, right? You have your regular Ethereum layer one, and then you have these different chains that are the layer two chains that just creates branches and you kind of go off the state and you start creating a different chain and then you can settle back with like the results. So it's kind of like you start at block X, like block a hundred, uh, you start going off chain, you go creating blocks, you interact with dApps there. And then the result of all those just come back to Ethereum and you prove that those results are actually correct. And that's where the, the roll-up part of this comes in. But before I get into roll-ups, I want to give a bit more of, let's say, an abstract view of this, that at least it helps me with the intuition. And yeah, the, the diagrams aren't, let's say, designer quality, but I tried to go more for the content here. Something's unclear, feel free to shout about it on the chat. Uh, maybe not shout. But... <laughs> But so, okay, we have this layer two virtual machine, right? We were saying we want to offload some of the computation from Arbitrum to the separate virtual machine. Uh, sorry, from Ethereum to the separate virtual machine, for example, the Arbitrum virtual machine. And we just have a series of inputs that is going into this different virtual machine, right? And these inputs is an abstract way of saying like user transactions, or for example, deposits coming in of Ethereum. And those are the inputs. That's everything that's going into this virtual machine. And then you just execute this stuff. And this virtual machine is always deterministic and you get only one result that is the correct results when you, when you do this execution. And that's kind of the view, right? So you have the separate virtual machine, but you still want to inherit the security of the layer one. So a cool way of viewing this is kind of like putting them side by side. You have two separate virtual machines. You have the layer one, and then you have the layer two. And can we set this up in a way where like the layer two virtual machine can be let's say enforced on the layer one. And the way we do it is, for example, when you have inputs like transactions from the user, all of these, they don't go straight to the layer two. What happens is they go into the layer one and this data is always available there. So what that means is anyone who's running an Ethereum node can see everything that's going into Arbitrum. And we produce this open source software that you can check out on our GitHub that is the node in the virtual machine where you can get all these inputs from your Ethereum node. You can execute everything and you can see the outputs. And the idea is that we post these outputs back into Ethereum and anyone can actually verify if these are correct or not. And I'd say that's the, the key part of, of the rollup. That is we get a lot of these inputs, we roll them together. We don't execute them on the layer one but instead we just prove it back after a bunch of these have been executed on this separate virtual machine. And I'd say this is one of the defining characteristics of a rollup. And there are different flavors of rollup that I'll get into it a bit later. 
But yeah, if, if you've actually interacted with Arbitrum in the last couple of weeks or months, uh, you'll notice that this is missing one key thing, which is the sequencer. And the idea of the sequencer is that it jumps here in between and it's a, a trusted party. And the idea is that this trusted party has one superpower, which is to order transactions. So they're actually able to front run everyone. And it's something that you trust, but it comes with a very cool side effect, which is one, you get fast soft confirmations, which means if you're using SushiSwap, you're using Uniswap, you're using any DAP on the layer two, you get an instant confirmation in two seconds, one second. And the UX for that just feels so good, especially if you're coming from a different chain. Like, I don't know about uh, other people, but I, I, it's quite annoying sometimes to actually deal with the delays and of transaction inclusion on the L1. And well, you might say like, this is bad, you still have a centralization vector, but the cool thing is the sequencer can never steal user funds. The only thing it can do is actually front run people. And something we're working on is actually research on how to decentralize the sequencing service. And this is actually active like R&D engineering we're doing. And I'd say it's not exactly my area of expertise. It's more of my other workmates. And I believe Ed did a presentation where he touched on this a couple of weeks ago. We have documentation online about this. So I'll just gloss over the sequencer a bit so we can keep it on the high level optimistic role of theme. Hey, we can work with on that. So okay. yeah, roll-ups, as we were... Sorry, uh, right, I think so I, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, mute uh, everyone else. Sorry about that, Fred. It's all good. So yeah, we were talking before about like, uh, let me bring it back to this diagram. It's about the inputs going to the layer one virtual machine, right? And this is what we call the data availability part. And this is the one of the key differentiations when you're looking at some solutions, for example, like comparing optimistic rollups to Plasma. What Plasma does is uh, Plasma doesn't post all this all this data on the layer one. So when you don't post this data, uh, there's the nice side that you don't need to pay for this call data, which is a cost that goes to users. But the downside is how do you prove this back then? Because if you have all the data there, I can you can always reconstruct the execution of a rollup. But if the data isn't available, like, what can you do? It gets a bit trickier, right? When you get into the ZK space, you have like some Validium designs that are able to make some different trade-offs. And that's also interesting, but that, that conversation would also take over like at least two hours of our time. We can maybe like talk a bit high level after, maybe in the fireside, if people are interested in it. But yeah, uh, rollups, we're talking about this data availability, but I think there is a key point that is also very relevant which is the bridge. That is, when you're talking about a, a layer two scaling solution, such as a rollup, uh, you, have, you have a bridge, which, it, which what means is you're able to send messages from Ethereum to Arbitrum and the other way around from Arbitrum to Ethereum, but having these messages be enforced by the protocol itself. So for example, traditionally, if you're going from with your assets, for example, you want to send ETH from ETH to a side chain or to a different chain altogether uh, or whatever, what happens is many times you need to go through these bridges that are either custodial or based on authority or have some other kind of like trust assumption based on like a consensus. There are, there are all kinds of different approaches, but many times this boils down to like different security guarantees or to having like, uh, to having like less trust and or crypto or a crypto economic incentive many times is what happens in these bridges. For example, you need someone who use a stake and then they, they, you do block validation based on that. But when you're talking about a rollup, the protocol is actually what enforces this communication between Ethereum and Arbitrum and between Arbitrum and Ethereum. So it's not a crypto economic issue. It's if the Arbitrum protocol is working correctly, then that works correctly. And yeah, by the way, this is a lot of information um, I'm spinning out, so feel free to look. If you have questions or particular parts that I didn't explain very well, uh, feel free to send it on the chat. I already see one interesting question and that one I'll leave to the end because uh, <laughs> that's a spicier one, uh, but okay. Uh, third point that's on the slides, that is the roll-up centric Ethereum roadmap. And what I mean by that is ETH2, right? A lot of people are like, oh, ETH2 is right around the corner. Uh, the merge is gonna happen soon. We're all looking forward to that. Isn't that gonna solve our scaling problems? And it's true, it's gonna help us a lot. But one of the things it's gonna help is actually help the rollups scale Ethereum as well. 
because uh, if two phase one, what it does is it gives us data shards. And as we're talking about here, data availability is a key part of rollups. And it's actually one of the main driving, driving factors of cost. So we've been deployed for like over a month now uh, for users. And I'd say like most of the fees that our users encourage is just from like posting this data on the layer one. And as soon as if two uh, the data shards from if two are out, I think that's phase one, if memory serves me right. Uh, what that means is we'll be able to use these different data shards for our data availability, which drives the cost down like quite a bit, which is something that at least I'm personally looking forward to. And a lot of people were, let's say the community was talking about like uh, the roadmap being about everything in if two building up towards these execution shards. But there was this big post, I think, uh, late last year by Vitalik, where he was like, hmm, what if instead of making these complex execution shards, we just keep the data shards that we've been talking about and we know how to do, and instead we just use the rollups for execution? And this is the, the direction I see a lot of the community heading now and a lot of the developers thinking about this. Yeah, uh, so let's talk about rollups, right? And as we said before, there are different flavors of rollups. I also saw here in the chats that someone's asking, why Arbitrum chose optimistic rollups versus ZK rollups? And yeah, I guess the first question is what's an optimistic rollup or a ZK rollup, right? And if I bring it back to my beautiful diagram here, it's, I guess it's about this output part here. And it is, we know how we get the inputs, we feed it into the virtual machine and we get an output. But the question is, how do you convince the layer one? How do you prove it back to the layer one that these outputs are actually correct? And I'd say there are maybe two main schools of thought here, one being optimistic rollups and the other one being ZK rollups. And the way ZK rollups do is what they do is validity proofs. They create this zero knowledge proof that says like, I'm able to prove to the L1 using some fancy cryptography that all these transactions that went off chain are actually valid. And one of the differences between this is that you actually need to use elaborate cryptography and actually have all these representations inside a way that a zero knowledge proof can represent it. And the way we do it is we take a slightly different approach. That is, we know this L2 virtual machine here, right? And what we do is we optimistically accept like the outputs and we just give a delay window of let's say seven days. That's the parameter we have right now. And we say, anyone can challenge uh, an output saying that that output is incorrect. And you don't need to like re-execute all the transactions to see that those outputs are incorrect. What you actually do is you only execute one step of execution. So let's say I'm someone who executed all the inputs and set a result in chain, and Harith is someone who disagrees with me. And we both have stake on the layer one contract. And what we do is we play a bisection game, which is kind of like a binary search where we go like, oh, I executed all this gas of these transactions. And I believe we disagree either in the first half or the second half. And I ask you that, like, which half is it? And then you tell me a half, and then we go by setting until we reach actually one opcode of execution, one like single instruction of this layer two virtual machine. And that's the only thing that we actually execute to, to give a fraud proof saying like, see, this particular part is correct. And for this to work, that's why the inputs are so, so important because these are always available. Like the L1 smart contract knows the inputs of transactions. So we can actually effectively prove all this fraud efficiently because the data is there for us. So yeah, uh, that's the optimistic rollups. And we take this optimistic execution approach kind of where on how we take these outputs from the layer two back into the layer one. And that's very important because that's how we validate, for example, withdrawals. So if you have your L2 ETH and you want to send it back to the L1, you always need to wait for this annoying seven day window. And that is because like, if someone wants to prove fraud, you need to guarantee that they won't be censored on Ethereum layer one. And I, I guess the general community sentiment is that one week is a number that gives us all confidence that this will uphold. And yeah. Something, another really cool thing about the optimistic rollup uh, style of proofs is that we are able to have a one of N trust assumption. That is, we call it the any trust guarantee uh, in Optimum Labs. And the idea is that like, it's not like the traditional L1 where you need 51% of the network for proof of work to be correct and valid. For your L2 network to actually execute correctly, 
all you need is one validator to actually be, be honest. And that's really cool because uh, it changes these trust models, right? That is, you don't need 51% of the network. You're able to like just have small networks, for example, if you have a game or an NFT service or something like that, where on the rest of the DAP and the protocol, you already have this notion of a party with these privileges, like on a game minting NFTs. This translates very well to this trust assumption if you want to run your own rollup or have a validator. And many times when users are interacting with the DAP, they already are making this implicit trust assumption. And having this one of N, I, I personally think is really neat. That is the way uh, the way that the contracts can be enforced on the L1 is the sense that anyone can go there and be like, oh, this output is wrong. Let's do the fraud proofs. Let's see how it goes. And yeah, uh, the fraud proofs, as I was saying before, is just the challenges on the layer one chain. Yeah, uh, here someone was saying on the chat about ZK rollups versus optimistic. And yeah, so the computation is lighter on the optimistic uh, when you're comparing to ZK because I, I hear that one of the challenges is actually the prover, right? To generate this zero knowledge proof is a very expensive process. Uh, and that's one of the limitations, but there's active research that does like, has been doing great work on this that I've also been keeping track. And yeah, uh, we, don't, we don't ignore the ZK research that's going down on the ecosystem. It's like, it's really interesting tech. And of course we've got our eyes on it as well. But uh, another limitation is kind of like when you're comparing this idea of ZK versus optimistic is the idea that it's like, this is very new cryptography and it's very interesting and cool. But like from our process of deployments, mainnet and getting prepared and all that, I believe that the, the steps to get there are really tough. And when you have a system as complex as like a ZK proving system, it gets even an order of magnitude tougher to actually ship and pull it off. But there are great minds and great people and projects actually working on this actively, which is really cool to see. And yeah, uh, bring it back to Arbitrum, right? What's there? What do we have deployed when you say Arbitrum 1? What is our tech? And yeah, as we said on the optimistic rollup side of things, we need a prover for the optimistic side of things, right? So what that means is we have our L2 virtual machine and we have the all the opcodes implemented in Solidity and it's possible to actually prove that a step of execution of this virtual machine was incorrect. On top of that, we also have our rollup protocol that is live and running right now as we speak. It's been for a couple of months. And this rollup protocol, what it does is it allows different people to stake in in like the results of like the outputs of the L2 VM. And when two, two different outputs disagree with each other, two different stakers, what happens is they're able to challenge each other and find the step of execution where they disagree and actually prove that. So that's how these two feed into each other. And the third thing is actually the layer two execution environments, right, it's the VM. So we're actively able to use our system and your smart contracts work and it's beautiful. But there's one disclaimer, which is we're still in beta. And what that means is we're live on mainnet. The main components of the system are there, but we still hold like admin privileges and superpowers. That is, uh, we have a credibility over the contracts. And if you find issues which we actively look for and are doing security due diligence actively, uh, we do patch them. And that's why we keep always the Arbitrum beta moniker. It is to signal to users that yes, we do still hold the superpower. Yeah, what's next? Uh, we're actively working on Arbitrum uh, to actually increase the security and the efficiency and the throughput of the whole system, right? And if anyone has been actively looking at our social media, we had a big announcement uh, last night, uh, at least last night in my time zone, and is that Arbitrum Nitro or Nitro, I guess Nitro, depends on the pronunciation, uh, is going to be coming soon. Uh, and what's up with that? The idea is that we're going to have a different VM and prover. Uh, the new VM we're looking at is WASM, which is a very fast and battle tested execution environment. Uh, but we're keeping the same rollup. Uh, if we look into like what we were talking about before, this rollup side is still the same. Like for the dispute resolution, is the same we've been using for a long time. We're just switching out a couple of components like the VM and the prover side of things to get the speed up that we want. And I guess that brings a natural question, which is like, oh, so if you're doing this big upgrade, should I just hold off and deploy my contracts? Maybe it's not worth it until you actually do that. What's up? And I'd say, don't do that. Just go to Arbitrum, test your stuff there around today because it's gonna be a seamless upgrade and no migration will be needed. 
uh, and yeah, uh, it's going to be beautiful. And on top of that, uh, what's next? Uh, we have Arbitrum Nitro on the on the roadmap, and ETH2, of course, as we said before, uh, the data shards are going to be a great cost decrease for us, which is going to be really cool. And if you're curious about learning more, and we have a great section of our documentation called Inside Arbitrum, uh, where we do go a bit into the design rationale and some of the ideas behind, behind all this. Here's our, uh, a link to our Discord. I'll send it on the chat for everyone here, and also our Twitter to keep up with our with everything. And yeah, shameless plug, we're hiring uh, for various positions. Uh, yeah, if you think you're going to be a good fit, uh, send your CV over. And I'm open to questions, just brainstorming if there's any particular points people are interested in getting into from before. Yeah, glad to. Um, all right. Uh, thanks, Fred. Um, I think there are already a few questions, but uh, generally what we try and do is that um, this is fireside chat. So uh, everyone, please feel free again uh, to put your questions in the chat, or if you want to ask a question later, you can I believe you can raise your hand and I can uh, unmute you uh, to ask verbally yourself. Uh, but before we get into the kind of more heavier kind of questions, uh, I always like to start the five side check with um, asking our guest. So today, uh, Fred, like what was your personal story uh, behind getting into blockchain, getting into Ethereum, and how you ended up where you are now with off-chain labs? What's the story there? That's an interesting story, and I guess there are a couple of different phases that went into that. I initially like flirted with the ideas of blockchains and permissionless systems uh, when I was like in my teenage years, like just reading random stuff, random memes, of course, and just blog posts. But I didn't engage it, at, engage with it, like in a deep level and trying to understand what's going on under the hood and what guarantees we have, how all the systems come together. But like I, I flirted with the initial ideas of Bitcoin and permissionless systems, maybe in my seven, when I was 17, 16. And then I went off to university. And when I was in university, I had all these ideas lingering in my head and I was studying computer science. And I was in this random lab, just doing a coding assignment. And the guy next to me was like, hey, so tonight there's an event where you can get free beer. You wanna come? And I was like, I won't say no to free beer. <laughs> So I went there and it was actually a blockchain event and they had a bunch of developers and that got me hyped, not only because of the free beer, because then there they actually showed me the tech and from a technical perspective and I thought it was very cool. And from there on, it just became a huge rabbit hole where I started just reading and engaging with what I could. <laughs> um, and how did you end up with uh, Offchain Labs? Ah, that's a good question. So I graduated from uni and I was like, Hmm, I really like this blockchain stuff, but I'm not sure like in which mode I want to interact with it. Do I want to just like be independent, creating dApps and all that? And I saw this ETH research post by Harry, where he was this, Harry is our CTO at Offchain Labs, and where he was describing the an earlier version of Arbitrum. And I was like, damn, this is pretty cool tech. If I got to work with like that team on that thing, I think, on that team, on that product, I think I, it would be a great place and just really cool ideas going on and just trying to like, that was about at the time where the gas price where was starting going up. So I was like, I'll try sending my CV. I was a bit like, I won't get a chance, but I'll still try. And I sent my CV, got an interview, and then one thing led to the other, and here I am now. So <laughs> Nice. nice. And uh, interesting that you mentioned, Harry, because uh, it's a good segue to what I was going to ask next, uh, which is what was the, as far as you can share, um, what was the story behind off-chain labs itself, like starting up? Because... Uh, I think the, the founders were, I think, if not all, then most of them were like academics and they wrote some really cool papers like early on, like Flash Boys 2.0 and the instability of Bitcoin without block reward. So like um, what led this like group of academics into going into like the real world, you know, and, and like starting its own um, layer? It's actually a very interesting question and it's a great coincidence because when I interviewed with Harry, uh, I had a technical interview and it was right around the time of like the, the Bitcoin halving. And I had read his paper as well on the instability of Bitcoin with all the block reward. First thing I get into the interview, I'm like, Harry, are you nervous? They're going to half it again. I read your paper. I know you don't like it. And 
<laughs> it was a it was a very interesting interaction from here on. <laughs> but yeah, uh, they have some really interesting papers. And as you said, uh, they have a the co-founders have a research background, and I believe they were academics at Princeton. And the the ideas, the early ideas behind Arbitrum come from way back when uh, Ed, our chief scientist, had a had a lab at Princeton for research. And that's where the early ideas of like having the separate GM and proving it back to an original chain came from. And I believe they published uh, a paper where they actually formalized the system back in 2018. And the following year, they decided like, hmm, let's make a company out of this. I think we can pull it off. And they decided to actually implement all this and make it production ready. Right, nice. Um, okay, I think I, I do want to make sure that everyone's questions uh, get asked. So I'll start with those first before I uh, put in any of mine. Uh, so I can uh, ask very early on, uh, what is the sort of uh, tech and UX uh, differences compared to optimism, which is like the big question, I guess, that you would have. Yeah, so I think optimism uh, is on the brink of announcing a couple of changes, right? So they have the OVM 2.0. And I'm not too familiar with their designs there, but what I'm familiar is their previous iteration. And I believe one of the hallmarks there is that we had our, this idea of the bike section game that I talked about, that is instead of we're doing a whole transaction to prove fraud, what we do is we bisect until a single op code is the difference between two people who are challenging each other. And we just execute that single op code for to see the difference in result. Uh, while they had a re-execution approach where the idea was like, you actually re-execute the whole transaction instead of just a single op code of the VM. And I believe that was the main difference. Uh, with their new iteration, I think they're gonna go into a interactive groups, which I think is a great decision on their part uh, because I, I think the whole design is neater that way. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, I'm not too familiar with their new system to be able to, to give a fair depiction here for everyone. So. Yeah, sorry for the disappointing answer. <laughs> uh, what, what you described earlier is essentially the multi-round fraud proof, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And and like you get to like um, minimize the amount of computation versus doing the whole thing. Okay. And um, uh, another major difference, and feel feel free to correct me, uh, that we've heard about uh, because we um, a while back we hosted the Flashbots team. And you know they're all about MEV. And one understanding I have at least of the difference is that like Arbitrum is uh, planning to or exploring like uh, this. Uh, you mentioned fair sequencing services, whereas Optimism wants to do like a like an auction kind of mechanism. Can you explain yeah. a little bit of of that? For us? Yeah, uh, of course. That's a very interesting point. And yeah, uh, I actually looked online a bit, and I wasn't able to find a lot of info on their their auctions on the MEV stuff. So that's why I said I, I wouldn't be able to give a fair description because I don't know where they plan to take it. But yeah, we're committed to try to decentralize as much as we can the sequencer service. And the idea is like uh, consensus protocols traditionally, they, they never took into account the idea of fairness in the ordering of, of the inputs of the stuff going into the system, into the consensus protocol. So it was an evergreen field to just like, what if we try to like actually define rigorously what it means to be fair in the ordering of these events and how much can we actually maximize for this, right? How can, can we ensure the fairness in this in a protocol? And these were brand new ideas. Our CEO, Stephen Goldfeder, he actually was part of a paper that pioneered this idea, I think one or two years back. And the paper gave an initial demonstration of like, how you can put these ideas in actually defining what this fairness means and how a consensus mechanism can show these properties. And yeah, uh, since then, uh, there has been more research going on to this and actually like the, looking into what would take to actually take this into production. And that's something we're actively looking into. But yeah, you should hear more from us on this soon. I, I guess this is as much as I can say now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Okay. I'll, I'll let you off the hook on that one. Um, uh, the next question, uh, Jun asks, um, why did Arbitrum choose optimistic versus ZK rollup? Yeah, so actually it, it goes back to what I was saying before, right? So there, are, there are a couple of trade-offs that go down as well. Like the ideas behind Arbitrum are like, they've been going on for a bit. And I'd say that this idea of like ZK rollups and optimistic rollups 
got really big, like, let's say, what, 2017. There was a famous like post by Vitalik on youth research where he was like, damn, we can get 300 TPS now. And looking back, it's kind of like, damn, 300 TPS, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea was like this, this idea of like zero knowledge proofs for this, for this particular application is, is quite new, right? And when you talk about ZK snarks, I, I believe a lot of the innovation on, on the field was actually driven by these, by these blockchain protocols actually doing active research and protocol development on top of these. So I guess it's a mix of like different trade-offs and also just different positionings. And it's it's like, we've had our eyes on the tech, but we've been building different tech for before that, right? And the, by the time that like zero knowledge proofs, like zero knowledge proofs are a different construct with different like trade-offs. And I believe the approach we took to building our system was prioritizing different things. And also at the time, the technology was very different from what we see today. And it will be very different five years from now and two years from now, so yeah. All right, thanks. Um, then I think there's a couple of questions which are related. Essentially, uh, any exchange to withdraw directly to Arbitrum and any fiat on ramps uh, to Arbitrum? So I, I think, I'm not sure. But I know we have announced a couple of them. I don't know which ones are live and which ones aren't. I'd say the best place for you to look at if you want this information is we have a portal of what's live and what isn't. And yeah, and on social media, we will for sure make an announcement uh, as we onboard new people doing on and off ramping into Arbitrum. Like we were talking with quite a few, like a number of projects about this. I'm, I just don't think I can name drop here right now, <laughs> but you see a lot of announcements soon. <laughs> okay, and um, actually on that note, um, because, uh, and I think this is a question that, that someone asked uh, me recently, like uh, um, there is one sort of trustless bridge, uh, the official trustless bridge between Arbitrum and um, Ethereum layer one, right? Um, so if you withdraw directly from an exchange, um, first question, are you using the, the main trustless bridge of Arbitrum? And if not, then what are the trust assumptions that you're making uh, by going directly from an exchange? So when you're going directly from an exchange, uh, you're first trusting the exchange itself and then the platform you're being onboarded to, right? So when you talk about like depositing from an exchange, the idea is that you give an exchange your address and they transfer the funds there. And that's a regular transaction on the L2. And when you're withdrawing from Arbitrum, let's say to a centralized exchange, uh, it's the same process. You have your address with your with your funds, and you send it to an address that is controlled by, by this exchange that then credits your account. And I'd say that you're not explicitly using this trustless bridge of ours. What happens behind the hood is that the exchange itself can use this to actually rebalance their funds, right? Because this exchange actually needs to hold liquidity on the L2, on the L1, in, in every chain that it's present. And it can use these trustless bridges to actually rebalance their funds without needing to make big crypto economic like trusting assumptions. Right. And uh, a related question is um, what about other bridges like between L1 and L2? Like uh, I think there's uh, like seller bridge, hop uh, protocol. Like what would be the difference between using those bridges versus the Arbitrum uh, main one? Yeah. So some of these bridges have some really cool characteristics. So for example, as we were talking before, you need to give a time a time window for people to be able to give fraud proofs on Ethereum uh, with regards to Arbitrum. So what that means is there is a delay, right? Whenever you want to withdraw funds, it takes seven days for this to take effect. And the user experience for that is very bad. It's very, it's very annoying. So that's where these bridges come in. That is, we have this protocol level bridge that is low but robust. And then you have the you have other bridges that try to bridge this gap. Uh, sorry for the pun, couldn't help myself. But <laughs> yeah, uh, you have many. You have Hop, you have Connect, you have Seabridge, as you said. Uh, and the idea is that dif different ones have different constructs. So for example, there's a classic approach, which is hash time locks. You can use hash time locks to just, use, to just do an atomic swap between Arbitrum and Ethereum. And the bridge could be just that, right? Someone who has liquidity and facilitates that for you to just bridging your funds from one side to the other. Uh, that doesn't really work for a generalized communication, but it works for just sending your assets. 
And you have, for example, Connext uses state channels uh, to actually do this sending from one layer to the other. And I'd say each bridge has their own flavor and different assumptions and different characteristics. So it's, it's hard to put everything in one box. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, sort of Green Hero is asking what kind of dApps or services are suitable to be on Arbitrum? So that's a great question. And at least I think every dApp is pretty much suitable to be on Arbitrum. Uh, <laughs> Uh, come join us, uh, <laughs> send us to DM on Twitter. Uh, but I, I'd say there are particular dApps that can, can take better advantage of the scaling benefits of an optimistic rollup, right? As I was saying before, uh, one of the key things, is, one of the key drivers of cost is actually making the data available in the L1. It is us actually posting all, that, all, that, all those inputs into Ethereum itself. And that's most of the cost. So if you have an application that doesn't use a lot of call data, but uses a lot of computation mm -hmm. itself, it can take, it can have even better use of Arbitrum, right? So a quick example would be, if your DAP is the kind of DAP that has like a lot of like input data that needs to go into each transaction, all of that's like, if you have a huge byte array that needs to go in, all that also needs to go into Ethereum and that generates a lot of cost. But if you have a different protocol that just uses like not a lot of, inputs, but a lot of computation inside of it. And that's where you see a lot of savings come in. I don't know. I think there are also like different ways of positioning this. I think that just like a lot of dApps that have been traditionally priced out from Ethereum mainnets, just because it's too expensive to use it. I think that there's a great argument to try a scaling solution. And yeah, there are, there are like so many designs that we haven't even begun to explore as a community that are enabled by this. And I'd say that that's one of the things I'm mostly looking forward to. And that's why I find these meetups so much fun because it's all about communicating the technology to the community. So the community can actually build and do all the cool stuff, right? Uh, it's it's kind of like an emergent phenomena where it's kind of like, it's not just about putting out cool text, it's about the whole community being on top of that and the network effect of all of us building on top of all of this. Okay. Maybe another way of asking the same question is, uh, what depth would you like to see on Arbitrum? Uh, and if not a name, but like a, a type of that. So I was, I was a big gamer when I was younger. So I, I always have a soft spot on my heart for like pay to earn. And I think that just like being able to reduce the cost of all that is just more that goes to the users and the people engaging in these platforms. And as it like, we're still in the early days of rollups. So as it gets easier to actually maintain and deploy rollups, one thing that I'm curious about, like seeing the future is just like these independent rollups that are just for gaming, right? Because the cool thing of being a rollup with everyone else is that you have the composability with them. But many times in these games, you can have just an independent instance. And when you're using a rollup, you're still inheriting all the security from Ethereum. And like, I think with games, you can really hit a soft spot, like a sweet spot there, which is kind of like, you don't need the direct composability. It's all right if it takes a bit on most cases and you still have like huge cost savings for your users. So I'd say that's the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart. Okay. Uh, I would say if, if somehow you guys can convince the uh, XC Infinity people to go on Arbitrum, then yeah, you're probably going to like max out uh, whatever current limits you have <laughs> already. That's true, that's true. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Toga is asking... Uh, well, it's not when token, but when airdrop. Uh, um, um, we, you are I kind of you answered the when token question already. So maybe another way of asking this is um, like one issue that chains, whether it's L one or L two, have is like how do you get liquidity on right? Because then there's a network effect that liquidity begets more liquidity. So are there any ideas or or, or plans on like how do you like pull even more liquidity onto Arbitrum. So uh, as we were talking before, I think it was before we started the recording, right? We had some like crazy like uh, yield farming pools just one weekend. So I think we didn't really <coughs> have the problem of like lack of liquidity. I think it was more like, at least I woke up and I was like, damn, we have $1 billion in the system. <laughs> I was a bit scared like, <laughs> because it's only just spiked. Uh, I wouldn't say scared, let's say I was surprised. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> I don't think we're having this issue. And I think just like having the great tech 
having great tech, a great team working on this tech, and the commitment to the community is what we do. And that's just like naturally has like its consequences. That is liquidity flow in, flows in, we have permissionless deployments. Anyone can come and attract liquidity. It's all about like, it's not necessarily us explicitly trying to do an airdrop to bring liquidity in, but is us putting out the tech that there is demand for it. We know that, that like devs want it, users want it, and people are using it. And yeah, I think there's no need for an airdrop in between that. Okay. Um, I think regardless of what you say, people will uh, still ask uh, these kinds of questions. <laughs> Next time. I do think this is recorded. I'll just play this back to them. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, okay. Um, another question that I had was, um, so uh, what we currently know of is uh, only Arbitrum 1, uh, but that isn't the only sort of Arbitrum layer 2 chain that uh, you guys are working on. Um, I think uh, recently, maybe like a month or two ago, uh, Reddit announced that they'll be doing their um, their chain or their, their community token uh, on uh, Arbitrum. Um, is there anything you can share? Maybe not like companies or projects that are planning to launch chains on Arbitrum, but like how that will work out uh, versus the current Arbitrum one? So yeah, uh, the way I see it is kind of what we were talking before that we have these data shards and we're talking about having different execution shards on Ethereum 2. Now these just kind of become rollups. And the way I see it is we have Arbitrum 1 and we do have Arbitrum 2, which is a Reddit contest, net, as you said. And I just see more and more of these like sharded execution environments coming along. And yeah, personally, I think that like uh, these Fortune 500 companies coming into these is, is a very interesting like value proposition because they're still able to have like inherits the security from Ethereum as a public permissionless chain, but they're still able to parameterize it for, for their particular like use case and their production needs and all that. And yeah, uh, I think there's just more and more interesting things to come. As I, I think with someone at the start of the presentation was also talking about like TikTok coming in with the like best moments and it's a similar idea. Uh, they picked a ZK rollup over an optimistic rollup and there are trade-offs there, but I think more and more companies are going to be on board with this idea. And um, related question would be, um, so because you described uh, earlier, you mentioned um, like with the Arbitrum Neutral, there's a change to Ewasm. So could there potentially be different um, sort of uh, different uh, VMs, uh, virtual machines on the different Arbitrum chains? Um, um, can there be different um, sort of just languages or difference in the, uh, maybe even like the sequencing kind of um, structure? Yeah, you're completely right. And the really cool thing is that with this roll-up design, this optimistic roll-up design is you have these, it's kind of what we're doing now, right? It's pluggable in the sense that you can have different systems with different VMs running with different capabilities. And uh, us moving towards the WASM environment is a really cool thing that is a lot of traditional languages are able to compile down to WASM as a target. So like, that means that we're gonna have Ethereum compatibility with the EVM for your solidity contracts, but we're even like, we're gonna maintain this compatibility, but we're gonna extend your experience. So that means that like, oh, you like coding in Rust, you prefer a different stack. Uh, we're much more like uh, welcoming to those kind of projects now. And I think this idea of like exploring with like, an L1's chain security uh, deriving from their consensus, such as from Ethereum, and just experimenting with different VMs, different execution environments, different formats. I think that's a really cool design. And I think a great example to give on that would be Fuel. Fuel is another optimistic rollup, but the approach they're doing is instead of having an account based model, because uh, in Ethereum we have this account based model, which in Arbitrum we also use. Uh, what Fuel does is they use a new TXO model following like the idea of like. Bitcoin a bit more. And you have some really cool properties that you can get from that, of course, always with trade-offs as well. But I think just this like wide experimentation that is happening around the whole community is really cool. And we'll see a lot of like interesting things coming out of it. Um, and I guess generally we try and avoid naming names, but like a, a very simplified question would be like, uh, would it be possible, let's say for uh, someone like Solana to just like be an Arbitrum rollup um, in the future? So what could happen is you could actually deploy a rollup to Solana itself, right? That is Solana is a layer one chain with its own consensus. 
and you could actually have like a system that does off-chain computation on it and then proves back. Okay. So yeah, I, I believe that like, just like we have a lot of rollups in Ethereum, we're going to start seeing like more rollups in different chains as well as we come to see it. And the design ends up being quite similar. If you look at like parachains from parity, it's kind of like same idea where you have like a base chain and then you derive the security on these other parachains and then you're able to settle back states and you have data availability on top of that. And I, there are like analogies between all of these. And I, I think it's just like a common design pattern that most people are settling onto. And I think the adoption in this way of viewing blockchains in like a more modular fashion, like having the data availability part, then having the execution part, I think that's going to become a bigger and bigger thing. Yeah, and that was actually going to be my next question because like uh, over the last like couple weeks, maybe like there's been a lot of these sort of threads. Uh, there's this one very popular guy on uh, Reddit. I think it's uh, Liberosist, you uh, slash Liberosist because we're writing these like really long and great threads about the modular versus monolithic um, vision of, of blockchains. Um, obviously, since you're doing a roll-up, uh, you're working on the modular side of things. Uh, do you see, a, maybe this is a bit of a sensitive question, but do you see a future for like monolithic uh, blockchains as well? Um, like let's say competing with the modular blockchains on um, like scaling and things like that. Yeah, so I guess there's a game of semantics there as well in terms of like what we mean by monolithic and modular and all that. But I believe that the distinction between like having the data availability layer and consensus, then you're having a separate execution layer. I, I find this a very neat way of dividing things because these are a different set of problems that, for example, if you're just talking about consensus and data availability, sometimes it's, it's much easier to reason about some problems than if you're also trying to optimize for the execution there. And the trade-offs you make on each space, if you're actually making this clear distinction, you can make like clearer trade-offs and have like better experience for users and developers on each one. And yeah, uh, there, I think that just, it's not about being monolithic versus modular, but it's about like identifying the gaps and like when you're able to decouple these, you can optimize better in different areas. Like, okay, uh, since you answered that so well, I'm gonna ask him even more, <laughs> So slightly more controversial question uh, would be, uh, in your opinion, would Bitcoin be able to have these uh, kinds of um, like modular um, uh, ecosystem? Yeah, so uh, that's an interesting question. And I guess the first thing, like Bitcoin is very interesting, right? Uh, but the thing is, if you're gonna code on top of it is what I was getting to before in the presentation is like the general computation that we have on the EVM is very useful because we're actually able to express uh, code and logic much better uh, than, than on Bitcoin scripts. Like the, this concept of like statefulness that you have on Ethereum, it's kind of like the world states that you have all the time. It has some trade-offs, but it makes it much easier to express, for example, the roll-up protocol. If you're trying to like, implement uh, the VM like proving system in Bitcoin scripts, like, damn, that's gonna be impressive. Uh, please let me know if you pull this off or if you have like a good approach to doing so, I think it's gonna be really cool. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's quite tough to pull that off in Bitcoin. Uh, they have this, uh, it's, let's say this community consensus around like minimalism, right? And the thing is, if you're, too minimal to the point where you can't add like, let's say a different hash recompile or something like that. It, it gets very hard to build on top. And there's also the, the notion of statefulness, right? Which makes it harder. But I'm not a big Bitcoin programmer myself. I guess other people would be able to answer this better, but I guess these are my naive views around this. Yeah, I think, um, again, I, I probably know even much less about uh, Bitcoin stuff uh, than you, but. Uh, I think some people have mentioned that if they were to be able to push certain um, uh, changes to the protocol, like uh, something called the covenant, uh, then it could be like a small step towards uh, enabling things yeah. like rollups. Um, but yeah, like you mentioned, like the, the consensus within the community is is a lot more on minimalism. So it might be a, a tough um, yeah. challenge to by, push that change. By covenant, you mean the conditional UTXOs, right? Uh, to be one? honest, I just know the name. I don't know anything more than that. So, uh, I, I think Fuel is doing something similar to that. They're mm -hmm. exploring that area, but doing it on top of not on top of Bitcoin itself. 
I think that building on top of Bitcoin, the lack of statefulness is, is a big hindrance as well, on top of like, lack of options. Yeah. We actually did an April Fool's joke earlier this year where we made a post on Twitter on the Off-Chain Labs account, just like, okay, we decided to pivot. Now we found out about this opcode to verify rollup on Bitcoin and we're just deploying everything on Bitcoin. It was a good April Fool's joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'm going to move on from uh, that kind of topic now. Uh, uh, Toga is asking, he's representing uh, Shiden, uh, oh, I'm not pronouncing it wrong, or slash Astar Network. It's a parachain on Polkadot and Kusama. Um, they also have ZK rollups and OVM. Uh, do you think it's possible to bridge between you and them? Yeah, so uh, for the trustless bridge I was talking about, uh, what happens is the bridges between your base chain and the layer 2 chain itself. So like the trustless communication you have would be between like layer one uh, and Polkadot. And to actually get this information across to Ethereum, I don't think there is a trustless bridge, but in terms of integrating using other solutions, uh, sure. Uh, there is like the IBC protocol, the interior blockchain communication protocol. I don't know how well that fits in into rollups. That's an interesting question for another day, but there are many different protocols that try to create this composability that for sure, it's interesting. Uh, the Itachi one you mentioned is uh, by Cosmos, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, then um, uh, moving on to another question. Um, so currently uh, the sequencer, as you said, is uh, centralized. Uh, do you have any kind of roadmap or any kind of indicator for when you would be able to start decentralizing? I don't believe we've shared a public roadmap around uh, centralizing the sequencer, but if you follow us on Twitter and Discord, you get the news there once we do. Okay, okay. Uh, but like, is it in the kind of um, scale of years, months, or are you able to answer that? So, so I'm able to answer that our priorities right now are like security and shipping Nitro, as we're saying, and that's 100% on our roadmap and a priority as well that we've got our eyes on. Uh, it's hard to commit to like a quarter uh, next year or this year <laughs> or whatever, but <laughs> yeah, soon. <laughs> soon, TM. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so we mentioned China earlier in the monthly roundup, and there's like been a pretty huge crackdown. Like uh, it, we mentioned Spark Pool, uh, but also some of the exchanges. I think Huobi uh, shut down their China services, which you know like previous crackdowns hasn't really. Uh, haven't really had the effect that this one has. And um, as I understand it, there has been quite a, 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 I don't know if it's big, but like quite a, a community uh, in China for Arbitrum. And like, has, has that impacted um, the community at all over there? Yeah, that's a very good point, right? At first I was like, yeah, they ban every other week, Bitcoin and Ethereum, <laughs> like in cryptocurrencies in China, what's up this time? And then I started seeing that actually like the Chinese community was moving around this and actually like uh, responding to it much more. And yeah, I, I personally was concerned, but I'm not too sure. I think that like, when you have permissionless projects, you can't really come after like the teams, right? It's permissionless, you don't have control over it. And yeah, I guess I'm not the best political commentator for this, uh, but <laughs> I, I think they were going much more after, not necessarily like application level developers, but mostly people actually like putting out currencies and like more the service providers on the currency networks, for example, miners. So if you're like an application developer that deployed a smart contract and it's permissionless, you don't have control over it, it's kind of like, you can't really knock on a guy's door or a woman's door and ask them to take it down, right? It's not how the network works, but you can get the miners down. So yeah, that's um, why I think I, it was more chill for us. Right. Even and though for sure they felt the pressure. <laughs> Did you see like any like um, changes within the sort of Arbitrum uh, China community? Like, um, did they report anything? So, yeah, uh, I'm not that close to the China side. I, I do not speak uh, <laughs> Mandarin or Cantonese, uh, but we do have like uh, other people in the Arb in the Arbitrum Labs team that are more focused in that community. That's actually a very good point. I should pick their brain and see like how's the general sentiment. And I guess for our next meetup, we can also bring them over and have a conversation about that once the dust settles. Should be an interesting one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very good to see. Like, there's a big, um, China's very big. So, 
uh, we'd like to, to meet more of the people from there. Um, and related to the, the centralized sequencer question, um, are there any limits to the number of sequences? Because uh, like, I mean, it's probably not that relevant, but if you talk about like say uh, proof of authority and like delegated proof of state, there's always like a, a, a hard limit. Uh, do you have a similar kind of limit when it comes to sequences? So uh, I guess there's a trade-off that goes on here, right? That is when you're talking about sequencers, the cool thing about it is that it's able to give you quick finality, a soft confirmation on your transaction, right? That means that you're interacting with the network using your wallet and you send something over and you quickly get a response. And that feels really good, the great UX. But uh, as you increase the number of these sequencers, they need to like agree between them on the order of transactions between telling any user the result. So as you increase this number and they have to talk through the network and all that, you're actually increasing this latency. So as you increase this latency, adding more sequencers, you're kind of like undermining the biggest benefit that it actually brings. So I'd say there's a trade-off there, but there's still room to actually like have like quite a few sequencers reaching fast finality and actually giving these fast responses to the users. And the way I see it, uh, it's kind of like, it's about uh, the way the first sequence could work uh, that uh, we're looking at it is, you know, for example, BFT guarantee, a BFT consensus algorithm. And this consensus algorithm is modified, not modified, but adapted to have this like order fairness. And you have like a number of sequencers running on the L2 and they achieve this consensus between them to actually give users finality. And as I said before, the trade-off is kind of like, as you increase this pool, you, you lose on the, like, on the quickness. Um, so, so maybe if we were to reword that, like, if we wanted to keep the latency that the Ethereum Day 1 currently has, um, do we know like a hard number of, of a ceiling uh, of the number of sequences with the current technology? So, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe there is, but not that I'm aware of. Uh, and on top of that, even defining the L1 latency is a bit tough, right? You have blocks every 15 seconds, but next block inclusion, only if you're willing to pay a lot of money, you can actually make a strong statement about that. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so um, we are coming up to 9.30, which uh, we'd like to end on time. So if you guys have any questions at all uh, that you wanna ask uh, Fred, uh, please feel free to put in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, I'll ask you like a couple other questions uh, while I still can. Um, so uh, would you be able to like very quickly, um, if possible, kind of describe the different uh, layer two approaches out there? Uh, I think you touched a little bit on ZK Rola, but there's others like, um, you might have covered Plasma as well, but like uh, Validium, I think there's like this uh, uh, Volition, um, like a couple of different uh, ones, like would you be able to share? Quickly on that? Yeah. I guess uh, each one has its own nuances, but uh, I guess there are trade offs made from some of them that are easy to point out. Uh, let's say, for example, if you compare an optimistic a roll up with a plasma solution, say the main difference there between the two is the data availability. The plasma doesn't actually post this data on chain. And I'd say that's the defining factor. When you're comparing a roll up to a validium, uh, I'm not too familiar. I'm not the best person to talk about that in the ZK space, but I believe that the idea is with the Validium system, you post only some of the data, but not all of it, just enough so you can actually validate the ZK proof, which is kind of like, it's not really plasma that you don't post any of the data, but it's also not also like a roll up where you post all of it. Uh, and there are like other iterations on top of it. I think Starkware is working on Adamantium and there are like a bunch of words for a bunch of other like ways you mix and match these different flavors of ways of doing things. And yeah, and there are some great resources around that. The Ethereum Foundation actually has some great definitions around some of these, if people are interested in, share the link. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the Vibranium uh, uh, version <laughs> of these things. Uh, okay, and um, okay, one hopefully last, like slightly more controversial question is, um, uh, Within the community, there's like this kind of debate between what is considered layer two and what is a side chain. Uh, do you have your like personal thoughts on like what would constitute a layer two and versus a side chain and whether or not this even matters and it's just a matter of semantics? 
I think it does matter. And the way, like, the words we use affect a lot the way people interpret these things, right? Uh, I guess there's a contrasting ideas around this, but the way I see it is a layer two chain, it attempts to inherit as much as it can the security from its layer one chain. And a side chain doesn't, right? You, you can just have your own consensus mechanism on a separate network and your own nodes doing all that as many projects do. And that's fine, that's a side chain. You have your own consensus, your own trust assumptions and guarantees. And then, yes, it is a trick question, Caleb, uh, <laughs> but I, I did notice in time. <laughs> Uh, but the idea is that like, I guess some people draw the line in different places, but where I see it is if you're inheriting the security from the layer one, you're a layer two, you are like building on top of that instead of building besides that, which would be a side chain. And some projects sometimes ship parts of their products. And let's say they, a project can commit themselves to like having fraud proofs and to having their system actually inheriting the security, but many times they ship like other parts of the system first, and then they lack these parts that are actually where you get the safety from. And I think that's what created a lot of drama in the ecosystem. And there are like constant crypto Twitter debates, which sometimes are fun, sometimes are too heated. Uh, <laughs> but that's the way I view the definitions. And I think there was a recent revision on the Ethereum's website itself on how they define layer two rollups. That I think the guys at Layer 2 Beats were the ones who pushed for that. L2 Beats is a really, is a really cool resource as well. That what they do is they, they list uh, many different L2 solutions and how they approach it, the different like risks and trade-offs. And yeah, they also have their definition on the pack, if you're curious. For example, I think they don't list uh, Polygon and they describe why they believe it's not an L2. So I think that kind of covers uh, Toga's question uh, in the chat uh, already. <laughs> so uh, we have three minutes. I, I'm going to ask you like a couple last question. Um, so do you mind sharing a little bit of what happened over the weekend? Uh, um, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, you want to join me for that one, Caleb? <laughs> uh, maybe I can ask Caleb to unmute. Fine. Uh, I don't think... Um, I don't think many people are aware of this yeah we kept it on the down low i was like <laughs> uh, i think it was friday afternoon from your friday evening i was just on crypto twitter going through uh, i was i was feeling a bit sick i wasn't going to go out then i saw this weird thing this guy did a library that was called the create three which was a different way of creating contracts and i was reading through this i was like this is some funky solidity but it's kind of cool and then as soon as i got it i was like damn this actually breaks uh, something on ether scan i need to tell those guys but there was a gap in between there that was friday night i i went to sleep like this idea is in my head i was like maybe we we'll work on ether scan maybe not i did a quick demo it didn't really work then i went to sleep and then i woke up on the saturday and i was like okay so ah if i do that little change then it will actually break and then i did it and i was like hey caleb do you see this contract <laughs> i think i found a problem <laughs> Yeah, so you caught me on a Saturday, on a Saturday evening. It was about 11 o'clock during that time. So yeah, I saw your message and it was about gaming the verification system. Um, it was nice that you caught it on Rinkaby because explicitly, <laughs> um, maybe before I go to that, uh, for, for, the, for the benefit of the audience, the, the idea is that uh, there's this guy called Augustine. He came up with a really cool, funky way of creating contracts. So it uses a combination of create two and create one to be you so that you can deploy contracts back on the same address. Um, because the thing is we have nonsense and if you change the bytecode, create two will end up deploying it on another address. So what, what he does is he uses a combination of create two and create one to be able to redeploy even different bytecodes on the same address. So Fred noticed it, uh, he pinged this up. He tested it on Rinkaby, which yeah, I can see that and I could recreate it as well. Uh, I started studying it because it was really weird. We, we do have this function called reinit on Etherscan where if we notice the contract was self-destructed before and we initialize with a different set of bytecodes, we will put it up and say, uh, it's sort of like a hackish thing which we did a couple of years back. I haven't quite got the time to expand on it yet, but uh, it's to basically alert the users visiting the address page that it's a reinit contract. So, that true, then after that started involving Matthew. 
uh, you duck through, duck through some of the code and stuff like that. No? So it's kind of sort of like the code with the get trace back then when we, when, when the tracing indexing would, was done, there's some differences between parity as well as GAF. There's some leftover sort of like legacy code stink, which we brought over as well. There's some issues there. So we had to sort of fix that, um, had to sort of re-index some, some of the areas. Unfortunately, it's one of the most comprehensive, one of the most complicated areas of our indexer. So it took out a large portion of Saturday and Sunday <laughs> to fix out. But right now it's fixed. Um, it's very much relevant only to get traces. Oh, no. That's why when Fred tested it out on Robston, it did not happen on Robston. <laughs> Uh, because for Robston, we are using parity trace. Yeah. So it affected some of the GAF nodes. Uh, we fixed it on some of our sister explorer as well. So what you should really be seeing is that you should see a re-init instead of having the code, the contract byte code being racked from underneath, you end up seeing the previously verified contract on a totally different set of byte code. Uh, exactly. What I found like particularly counterintuitive in the way that was set up is kind of like the self-destructs in my mind I was kind of like, it's going to wipe the contract storage, but I didn't realize that it actually wipes the entry on the account tree, right? So it wipes not only the storage, but the nonce, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And that just caught me off guard. And I was like, okay, it's going to catch a lot of people off guard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. anyway. Nick Johnson, Nick Johnson did mention that uh, even back then when Creed, yeah, Creed, yeah, like you mentioned on during Saturday night as well, when Create 2 was introduced in Constantinople with the bug is already, uh, this sort of rat pool behavior is already around. I think Nick Johnson mentioned that um, in order to prevent this sort of rug pull from happening, so uh, they shouldn't allow the nonce to be reset. But then again, there's sort of other quirks behind doing so. So, well, you see. Yeah. Something I'm curious about. I, I checked for a mainnet, and there were no resurrections from these self destructs. So, this was never used on like to actually exploit someone on mainnet. And just put it into context, the, the way that I find this like particularly dangerous is for example, a rug farm, right? Where I can deploy even like very similar byte codes that just changes like a single rug function and stuff like that. And even if you try to do some preliminary analysis on top of the verification, it could catch you off guard. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious if like your indexer spotted anything on other games. Might have to take a look, uh, not 100% certain. Still a bit hazy from the, from the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I guess I'm gonna so come in now. That, and, uh, sorry, go I'm on. gonna come in now, and I think uh, uh, it's probably not uh, something that 90% of the audience, including myself, uh, can keep up with. So uh, we'll let you guys have this discussion uh, later on. Um, it's very interesting, um, but we're already past the 9:30 uh, time, and I do want to make sure we uh, keep on time. Um, so um, yeah, thanks a lot, Fred, for your time um, and uh, for making Caleb's uh, weekend very. Um, uh, eventful. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure question. being here. Thank you for having me. And I'll try to find stuff on a Monday morning instead of Saturday afternoon next time, Caleb. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. No worries. I'm always happy to get you. Yep. Uh, and, and just uh, one final thing, Fred, very quickly uh, before uh, we let you go. Um, uh, if someone was a, a, a student or, or a, a programmer who's never touched the blockchain, like what advice would you give them uh, into like getting into this space? Go in with an open mind and don't be a maximalist about anything. Have an open mind about different ideas and different technologies. Because what we see in the space now is we see a lot of new interesting tech and just go in with an open mind and learn. There's a lot of interesting stuff to learn. And if you want to give me a follow or DM me on Twitter with any questions, I'm glad to help in your journey. And there's like, nowadays there are just so many like different resources on like, how to code, how to get started on all this. And yeah, if you read slides into my DMs with any questions, yeah, keep an open mind and remain curious. All right, thanks everyone. And I'm gonna end the official meetup uh, now.